Great Migrations, The People, The Lessons, and The Legacy. That's next on Columbus Neighborhoods. Support for Columbus Neighborhoods is provided by... At American Electric Power, we've been proud sponsors of WOSU Public Media for many years and strong supporters of our headquarter city here in Columbus, both downtown and in neighborhoods like yours. State auto insurance companies, serving customers and communities for nearly a century. Today, a technology and transformation company. Risk takers, creators, innovators. A company defined not by its history, but by its people. State Auto. The Columbus Foundation. Smart philanthropy for a smart city. ColumbusFoundation.org. Bailey Cavalieri. Your relationship with your law firm doesn't need to be complicated. It just needs to be right. CODA. Keeps our community moving forward. Falgren Mortine Marketing and Communications. Think wider. Ohio Health focuses on you and your family with a mission to improve the health of our communities and by contributions from these and other Columbus area families who support WOSU. Thank you. We're at the Shamrock Club on the south side where the Irish celebrate with a pint or two and with some great music in the pub on the weekends. History tells us that the Germans and the Irish came to Columbus in vast waves in the 1800s. Then between 1910 and 1970, in what's called the Great Migration, six million African Americans left the South for jobs in the North and thousands came here. And if you dig deeper, you'll see that another wave coincided with the Great Migration when folks from Appalachia and Mexico and Central America came here too. We're gonna to talk about all of that in this episode because moving toward a job and a safe place to live is not just an American dream, it's a narrative seen the world over. It quite literally is the story of us. The spirituals are primarily religious folk songs. They were birthed out of slavery. There were many different types of spirituals. They were used as praise songs. They were used um, as songs of communication. The texts primarily were biblical text, and they chose biblical text because of the Israelites in the Old Testament who were also an enslaved people. And they believed that if the God of the Israelites could deliver them, that that same God could deliver them as well. Throughout the 1800s, African-American settlements dotted Columbus with names like Peter's Run, Oak Woods, and Mudsack. There are a number of small African-American settlements all around central Ohio. A lot of them seem to be located around the Olentangy River. Some have names and some don't. So you had pockets all over the city. And that's what's unique about Columbus, that you had 10, 12 different little hamlets of Afro-American communities. Unreliable census numbers don't give us the whole picture, but what is known is that the African-American population started to swell during the South's turbulent reconstruction years after the Civil War. The intense segregation, the fact that people literally couldn't even be comfortable walking downtown or shopping or even attending church in their home community. Then there were issues like the political disenfranchisement that people literally could not vote and the lack of economic opportunities. And then we look at issues like lynching. So people who did try to fight back within their community were literally killed for their efforts. 
and then later terrorist groups like the Ku Klux Klan, which is, after all, a terrorist group, helped to keep people in their place. So the refugees who are coming north then after Reconstruction will be African Americans. The African American migration from the south to the north really represents one of the greatest internal mass migrations in world history. When the migration came along, it came because people needed a sense of hope. They needed a sense of safety. We're talking over over six million people who literally voted with their feet who literally said, we aren't going to stay where we are because we know that there's some place better we can be. As African Americans began to migrate north, they were coming north because the north was the promised land. You'd often heard in the spirituals they talked about getting to the promised land. They leave at the rate of 500 a day and 15,000 a month. And so by the time the 1930 has come, one-third of Alabama's black population is living north already, and that's just Alabama. It really is more, I'm, I'm seeking freedom, I'm seeking economic ability, I'm seeking a, a safety, very much like the refugees we see today. We were Americans. We still are Americans. This is our country. We fled within our own country. That's unbelievable. While Jim Crow laws pushed, the promise of steady work pulled. They could move from a, a working class to a middle class status within a lifetime. That was unique and almost unheard of for many Southern communities. And so part of the pull factor facilitating that was the role of the unions. And they had what were called the labor agents who went through various communities in the South advising people of particular economic opportunities, the cities they should go to, and the communities where they could live. My father came from Tennessee. The only way he escaped Tennessee, he couldn't go beyond the seventh grade because they wouldn't let you get an education beyond there, was join the military. From the military, he got to Ohio. That's the only way he got out of Tennessee. The African-American settlements swelled in population, civic groups and churches responded by locating housing and health care for the new arrivals. It's a part of our DNA that when we moved to communities, it was a community. We cared for one another. We looked after one another. Over the years, settlements came and went with little evidence that they ever existed. Some come to us in photographs, others are gone. The settlements are still a part of the fiber of the city. They all served a purpose. Once that purpose faded, when industry moved or circumstances, then we've lost those. Like, there's no sense that there was ever an Afro-American community in Hilliard. People moved, moved on. But one settlement survived and thrived. The Near East Side becomes really probably the heart and soul of what we think of as the African American community. Because whether you're rich or you're poor, that's where you're going to live. And so it is. It's a city within a city. By the 1930s, parts of it will take the term Bronzeville. Some residents still refer to the King Lincoln District by Bronzeville, still remember its mayors and political power at City Hall, and still mourn the raising of the Blackberry Patch to make way for Poindexter Village and the social strife that followed. One pushback of the Great Migration came in the form of neighborhood covenants that restricted the sale of real estate to minorities to the Irish, the Italians, and African Americans. Uh, ads for, for, for houses, for sale, or for rent, they specified no color, okay? Meaning no African Americans. And so we know that there was redlining, so that there were areas where African Americans could not purchase a home. The last thing you want to do 
in some people's minds is see them popping up in your neighborhood. And so there are restrictive covenants that come in that say you cannot sell to Italians, you cannot sell to African Americans, and that goes with the deed of your property. My dad had signed the papers because he was a very fair Afro-American. And by the time they had to get uh, signatures for my mom, it was too late. But they had not intended to sell to an Afro-American. The Great Migration lasted from 1910 to the 1970s, and the push and pull of immigrants both south to the north and east to the west left a unique settlement pattern different than other Midwestern cities. Columbus has never had a full-fledged ghetto, if you will, where the majority of African Americans resided as existed in Cleveland and to some extent in, in Cincinnati. Other historians have noted that one of the reasons why Columbus does not have the racial conflict at that time that others do is because at no part of the city are there more than 30% African American or any dominant ethnic group. And so because they're diffuse, it is not that armed racial conflict that you might be seeing in, in other places. I think the greatest impact of the Great Migration from the South to the North of African Americans is to open up more doors for education for black people. Education is the greatest building block to escape poverty, to escape racism, to build your own future. And the North gave us that opportunity. So the Great Migration made America stronger, made the black race richer in deed and in thought, and gave this country an opportunity to be the melting pot that it is. As the Great Migration brought thousands of African Americans here, the number of local African American businesses and professionals grew too. That community had a unique way of promoting the services and businesses that would cater to their needs in a city that was mostly segregated. Our own Brent Davis shows us how it was done. Hi, Karen. Hello, how are you today? Good, I'm great. Uh, what have you got for us? Uh, today we have here the Columbus Illustrated Directory, um, which was a directory of prominent African Americans in Columbus around the 1920s, 1930s. Now, I know there were guidebooks for the general population, but maybe just now starting for the African American population? This was published by a Reverend Mick Williams in the community as a way to build pride during an era of segregation about different members of the community who were doing really great things. Kind of a sign, too, of a growing African-American middle class and professional class in Columbus, right? Yeah, right before these directories were published, um, right around World War I, the African-American community in Columbus really boomed as the Great Migration started coming through Ohio, and suddenly there was a large population that was segregated from the rest of the city, and they needed services just like anyone else. So they were able to build businesses and build a community, and then the middle class begins to rise. What have you found in these books that's uh, particularly interesting? Well, this is Dr. William Method, and he, along with another doctor in the community, founded the first African-American-owned hospital in Columbus, named the Alpha Hospital, and that was at Long Street and 17th. And if you go down there today, there's actually a mural of Dr. Method on the building that was once his hospital. There were also only a few um, women that appeared in the book. One woman specifically. She ran a home for girls, for young teenage girls to grow up in and to have different um, advantages that they might not have, especially during the Great Depression. And so she appears in here. And then also a couple other aid organizations um, like Dr. William J. Woodland, who was a doctor during the day, um, but he also founded a group that became the Columbus Urban League. And so they initially, during the Great Migration, would just go down to Union Station and help people find their way into the neighborhood. And then once they started helping them find housing as well, they became the Urban League. It's fascinating to look at that community from, uh, from that time, so thanks for sharing it with us. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> 
You know, a lot of people talk about Latino immigration. Well, consider this. There are over 9,000 Latino-owned businesses in Ohio, and they generate $2.3 billion in commerce every year. And the migration is not as recent as you might think. In fact, it's generations old. Everybody can think back, remember, or remember the family history of somebody in their family who has that narrative of coming from the old country. We have had waves uh, of immigrants uh, primarily initially coming to Northwest Ohio from uh, south of the border and from Texas, beginning in the years immediately, perhaps even during, but immediately after the First World War, so during the early 1920s. So the Hispanic population, the Latino population, in, for example, Northwest Ohio and the Toledo area is a population that has been in Ohio for generations. In the 1950s and then in the 1960s, we saw the need for labor uh, in uh, the Cleveland area and in the Youngstown, Canton area because of the steel industry. An invitation was sent out for available workers from Puerto Rico. And as you know, Puerto Ricans are American citizens, but nevertheless, Latino population. And initially, young men arrived in the area to work uh, the steel mills and other heavy industry. And then in the 1960s, we had another influx because of agriculture. Also, the uh, phenomenon of the Cuban Revolution and over a million refugees leaving Cuba, and some of them coming to uh, Ohio. And then most recently, the influx in the uh, 90s following through to about 2010 because of the growth uh, in the real estate market and the construction industry and the service industry. Uh, it's, it's rare to find a family that every member is uh, undocumented. Usually it's a hybrid family. In the, in the last five years, I would say that the community the numbers has, have remained uh, stable uh, at approximately uh, 55,000. I was um, like self-employed, like contractor. I used to work on construction. I lived in the west side for five years and then I came to the north side. I was on the west side. Um, at the time, because property management is my background, they hired me because I was bilingual or I thought I was bilingual. I'm actually a Texican. So for me, I thought there was only one Spanish and I have found out there's actually lots of Spanish languages. So when I was on the west side, I worked for an owner that had a property that had Latinos. And so his idea was, hey, why don't we go to the north side? Because at the end of the day, everybody wants the same thing and I, there's a property in Westerville schools and if we do that before anybody else does, we'll be first. But one of the things that the North Side has is that um, there is a lot of help for the people. It doesn't matter if they're um, Hindu, Hispanic, Latino, um, American, anybody who, who, need, who has the need. The days of Chinatown, Spanish Harlem, those days are gone. Okay, uh, you might see Yes, originally there was a lot of uh, Hispanic people in the West Side. You see more now everywhere because, I, again, people are going to go where it's better, economically better. So they're going to go where the better schools. They're going to go where, uh, where there's more businesses. They're going to go where they feel safe. You know, in the neighborhoods, yeah, I think as people grow up and are around diverse people, it's their, it becomes their norm. It's normal for them. So they don't no longer see it. So when I came to the north side, that's when my, my whole life changing began. When I, when I fell uh, into the arms of a very great person, her name is Anna Maria, and she's been my mentor since the time I came to the north side. I started as a groundskeeper here, and then I went from groundskeeper to a painter. 
then from painter to a uh, main maintenance from maintenance I came to a leasing office and then a leasing manager and from leasing manager I went to manager property manager once I got into that point I decided to be like hey I know how to manage my business so I decided to start saving my money so it came through 10 years later you know so now I have on my beauty salon um, I've been there for almost 14 months and now I'm jumping into a, another project so it's not it's not only one business it's a second business that I have because I know that it's not only one thing you can do it's, there's a lot of other things you can do if you wanted to do it you need to bring your talent to the table and and and, and you need to know what exactly you're capable to to do. People today are interested in genealogy and are going back and researching those issues and it's hard to find uh, some family that does not embrace and celebrate the story of that one or more ancestor. Um, so that is uh, I think part of what what adds to the uniqueness of the community, the general community in central Ohio that perhaps other places don't embrace. The Appalachian migration to Columbus is a story of strong families and hard work. They came to Columbus because of the factories on the south side. But when the factories shut down, Appalachians still came and they're still coming today. I'm from Fairmont, West Virginia. Well, I, I would consider myself Appalachian. Um, and I, I know that there's two different pronunciations of that term, but I grew up saying Appalachian. Yeah, my father's side of the family uh, came over from Italy and immediately went to work in the mines. Um, my great-grandfather ended up actually having his own coal mine called Sam Poster Coal. Uh, he had worked for the company for a while and somehow squirreled away enough money to buy the mineral rights to his property. And uh, he, and, he and his boys, his four sons, worked that mine uh, for years. And uh, my grandfather went into the mines and was part of the number nine uh, explosions both in 54 and in 68. And then my father, three years after the, the last number nine disaster, uh, went into the mines in 71, and he worked 37 years for Consolidated Coal. There's a, a, there's a certain kind of uh, mindset that you're instilled with. There's a lot of self, self-responsibility, I guess. There's a, there's a lot of self-care. Uh, basically, you, it, it's almost like a pioneering kind of a thing. There's, there are very few people in that area. I, I live in a city now, that outnumbers the state that I left in population. And it took a couple of years to kind of adjust to that, just the overwhelming number of people, you know, and, and the, the scale of everything. And so it's just those kinds of things, that, that self-reliance that I, I, I'm only a generation or two removed from, that, uh, you know, coming here sort of made me stand out like a sore thumb in a way, you know, like I'm covered in grease because I worked on my car, I'm fixing just any, anything and everything for, for my friends. And you know, I, it came down to the way that I play music. You know, I, I put out my own records. I had my own record label. Uh, I ran my own bar. I bought two music venues and, and ran them so that my friends would have a place to play their weirdo music, you know? And, uh, and to create like a, a space for what I saw as, as the art of this area, which is incredibly influenced by people from where I'm from. That's one of the things that I try to do with my music is to tell the stories of where I'm from to make it a little less mysterious and you know shine a light on the fact that we're all just kind of doing the same thing here. Like, we all fall in love, we all know people who are addicted to something, we all know people that are you know lost in their jobs or their careers or their own minds or whatever. And so you know we try to tell those stories. Hold your memory. Cause nothing will replace him Like a meadow in the breeze Or the towns we were escaping 
thanks for being with us. And remember, you can catch all of our episodes on columbusneighborhoods.org, plus see our stories on the WOSU mobile app. And you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We'll see you back here next week on Columbus Neighborhoods. Fix up, baby, and talk about something else. But I just want to take you down. No, I don't care too much anymore for this part of town. Support for Columbus Neighborhoods is provided by at American Electric Power. We've been proud sponsors of WOSU Public Media for many years and strong supporters of our headquarters city here in Columbus, both downtown and in neighborhoods like yours. State auto insurance companies, serving customers and communities for nearly a century. Today, a technology and transformation company. Risk takers, creators, innovators. A company defined not by its history, but by its people. State auto. The Columbus Foundation. Smart philanthropy for a smart city. ColumbusFoundation.org. Bailey Cavalieri. Your relationship with your law firm doesn't need to be complicated. It just needs to be right. CODA. Keeps our community moving forward. Falgren Mortine. Marketing and communications. Think wider. Ohio Health. Focuses on you and your family with a mission to improve the health of our communities. And by contributions from these and other Columbus area families who support WOSU, thank you.